Change my shoes. <laughs> Good morning. The April the twentieth, two thousand sixteen meeting of the Board of Vestments is now called to order. In the interest of promoting the order and efficiencies of these hearings, persons who are disruptive to the hearing will be asked to leave the hearing room immediately. Meetings of the Board of Estimates are open to the public for the duration of the meeting. The hearing room must be vacated at the conclusion of the meeting. Failure to comply may result in a charge of trespassing. Madam Controller, are there any corrections, additions, or deferrals on the agenda? Yes, please note the following corrections. On page 70, in the background explanation, third paragraph, on line four, after the word annually, please delete over the first five years of the project. The sentence will now read, the MOU also addresses Sagamore's commitment to pay Moet at least $150,000 annually to fund youth works jobs or other comparable positions for young people. The next correction is on pages 46, through 48, 49 through 50, and one through 71. Protests were received from Ms. Kim Truehart. The board did receive and review her protests. However, they will not be heard. The protests have been sent to the submitting agency to respond directly to her. The third correction is on pages 46 through 48, 49 through 50, and page 70. A protest was received from Maryland Legal Aid representing the Cherry Hill Development Corporation. The protest was received late, however, it will be heard. Please note the following. Honorable Rawlings Blake will abstain on pages 17 and 18. The Honorable President Young, there are no abstentions. However, the President is voting no on pages 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 54, 55. Let me just go back a second. The president is voting no on pages 21 through 22, items 1 and 2. Page 23, item 3. The president is also voting no on pages 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 54, 55. The Honorable Comptroller is voting no on pages 31 through 32. Please note that Harriet Taylor, the Deputy Comptroller, will not be present today. Also, please note the following deferrals and withdrawals. Page 57 is being deferred for one week. Please note that page 69, item 2, is being withdrawn. Mr. President, that there are no other corrections. Thank you. I would direct the board members' attention to the memorandum from my office dated April the, 6th, uh, April the 18th. Another correction, please note that the Honorable Comptroller will abstain on pages 37 through 38, item 9, and page 69, number 1. Thank you. I would direct the board members' attention to the memorandum from my office dated April the 18th, 2016, identifying matters to be considered as routine agenda items together with any corrections and additions that have been noted by the controller. I will entertain a motion to approve all of the items contained on the routine agenda. Move approval of all items on the routine agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The motion carried. The routine agenda has been adopted. First, I want to recognize Councilwoman Clark, who had joined us today. Welcome. The first three items on the non-routine agenda can be heard together. They are pages 46 to 48, Department of Housing and Community Development, 
Memorandum of Understanding, pages 49 to 50, Mayor's Office of Minority and Women-Owned Businesses Development Memorandum of Understanding, page 70, Mayor's Office of Employment Development Memorandum of Understanding. Will the parties please come forward? particular order any order you want um, okay uh, uh, good morning uh, my name is Paul Graziano housing commissioner I will be speaking about the MOU related to inclusionary housing at Port Covington um, I think you have before you a, a an action memo um, let me briefly describe what the program uh, what the MOU proposes um, the Uh, Port Covington, as we know, will ha is proposed to have several thousand um, uh, housing units in addition to re you know that. You know that. Uh, Madam, would you please um, keep quiet, please? We don't know Madam, please keep quiet. I'm going to have to ask you to leave, please. Please be quiet. Continue. Okay. Give us some facts. Uh, Madam. Uh, any other outbursts, I'm going to ask that you be removed. As has been widely reported, the Nor uh, New uh, Newport Covington development will be a very large uh, multi-use project that will include uh, several thousand units of housing, uh, along with uh, retail, commercial, uh, manufacturing, and so forth. The purpose of this MOU, uh, the focus of this MOU is related to the housing and to ensure that there will be a broad mix of housing uh, within uh, the, the footprint of this project. Uh, so um, what this uh, MOU does is to establish a goal of 10 percent of the units being affordable at or below 80 percent of area median income, with a, actually a, a range of incomes below 80 percent of area median income. Um, it also uh, compels the developer uh, to submit applications for uh, low-income housing tax credits uh, in each tranche of units that are built. And we've divided this into tranches of 1,000 units each for purposes of measuring uh, where we are. So in other words, in the first 1,000 units that are built, 10% uh, of the units uh, the developer shall um, um, make application for low-income housing tax credits um, and that uh, the city will support those applications as we traditionally do um, with, uh, 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 say, home funds or, or, or other city gap funding. Uh, we're, we're making no commitment for extraordinary s support but just what we routine, routine, routinely, I'm sorry, uh, do for low-income housing tax credit project. Um, so the goal is that out of each thousand units that are built, um, there will be 100 low-income housing tax credit units. Uh, they would be eligible for people, uh, households with incomes at or below 60 percent of area median income. It is also anticipated that there would be uh, uh, the provision of project-based vouchers uh, for some number of the units to get this to make them affordable uh, at a much lower level than the 60 percent actually even to below 30 percent of area median income for some number of units now should it be infeasible um, to uh, receive uh, low-income housing tax credits for uh, for a particular tranche or if they weren't able to produce all 100 um, there the developer has agreed to uh, make payments uh, on a scale that is le uh, that that increases over time that is outlined in section 5 it starts with three thousand dollar fee per unit for the first thousand units uh, rising to five thousand dollars per unit uh, for anything over five thousand units um, so that fee would go into that those dollars would go into an affordable housing program for the city 
to do other projects in other places. However, there is also a provision, uh, and this was put in at the developer's request, that they have the opportunity, even if the, uh, they were not able to do the full 100 units as tax credits, that they, in lieu of paying the fee to the city, um, that they would put that money back in to subsidize um, the production of some number of affordable units on the site that would not be receiving tax credits and would not receive city subsidy. Um, so that would be obviously a much smaller number. Uh, so that, in essence, is the uh, is the uh, plan. Um, it, it we were asking for primarily uh, units of one, two, and three bedroom. Uh, there, the proposal uh, speaks of uh, a significant number of efficiency apartments. We've indicated we're not interested in efficiencies. That's really not where the demand is, um, and so we're pushing for one, t primarily for one, twos, and threes. And uh, that obviously we can deviate from that uh, on project to project uh, by, by um, uh, as we look at an individual project. But um, that is the goal. Um, and and uh, it will be reflective of the relative need. For instance, on the Housing Authority waiting list will be one of the sources we use to determine the bedroom distribution. Um, also, we're saying that the, the um, the quality of the housing, the design, and so forth should be comparable, and the management should be comparable to the market rate uh, units as well. Um, and so that's pretty much a summary of what's in the agreement. So, uh, Mr. President. Identify uh, yourself. My name is Gregory Countess. I'm with the Legal Aid Bureau. I filed a protest um, for the Cherry Hill Development Corporation. I have um, the CEO of that corporation here today. I want to make a couple of brief comments and then I will turn it over to him. The nature of our protest went to uh, two uh, concerns. Uh, one is the process and whether or not there was adequate, adequate transparency in that process. Our, our concern revolves around whether or not, in fact, um, these MOUs uh, comply with uh, already uh, City Council approved and adopted plans <coughs> for the middle branch and also for Cherry Hill in terms of jobs, uh, affordable housing, and also, particularly in the middle branch plan, it speaks to sustainable communities. And whether or not this development in and of itself, the impact that it will have on those communities. Um, we're concerned that without a full hearing on the potential impacts, that those impacts cannot be ascertained um, without a rigorous assessment. Um, further, we want to acknowledge here, um, because we had conversations with Sagmore, we noticed that in the MOU it talks about working with partners. Uh, I'll let Mr. Middleton address uh, the issue in terms of partnerships. We feel confident that, that Sagmore will, in fact, speak to the communities uh, about their concerns as in regard to uh, whether it be housing, jobs, and other issues that, that, that are um, of great concern to the community. Um, Mr. Middleton. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Michael Middleton. I work for the Cherry Hill Development Corporation. I'm also chairman of the Cherry Hill Community uh, Coalition. And I'm also a member of what is known as SB6 Coalition, which represents the South Baltimore six communities surrounding uh, the uh, development uh, in question today. That would include Westport, Mount Wine, and Lakeland, uh, Brooklyn, and Curtis Bay, along with Cherry Hill. So we're all communities that have a great deal of interest in the Sagamore development. My concern uh, with particularly the three matters brought here is that a memorandum of understanding has been presented uh, between the city and Sagamore for which the communities in which Sagamore has been negotiating, and we believe at that time negotiating in good faith, that we had no notice nor knowledge of any of these matters. The three matters that are addressed are matters of a particular concern for us. And it may be, in fact, that we have no opposition in relationship to the substance of the bill. But what we do have opposition to 
is not having any type of knowledge or the opportunity to participate in the process to, pre to be presented to this board, which affects Baltimore City and in particular with those surrounding communities that are most affected by this development. We're asking that, look, at least at a minimum, is to defer on ruling on this matter until we have an opportunity to make sure that the interests of our communities are taken care of. We've been negotiating with Sagamore for now for two months, and we believe that those representatives have talked with us in good faith, but not as transparent. Have we known that a memorandum of understanding between the city in relationship to jobs was to be presented today? We would have made sure that in relationship to how the mayor's office of employment development um, brought our jobs that maybe Cherry Hill or Westport had a certain percentage of the overall amount that we're talking about. But because this bill been submitted, we have no opportunity to have that discussion or know the eminence of any of the matters for which we as communities have concerns would have the opportunity to be discussed. We don't want to miss an opportunity um, to have the issues that concern us. And if we have issues such as this brought about before the community, uh, before the city has an opportunity to discuss it in detail, we think such opportunities would be missed. Thank you. The other two. I just want to, if I may, Mr. President, Madam Mayor. Make a point to uh, Mr. Middleton. Uh, number one, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and I just want to want to make sure that you're clear that this, uh, the MOUs that uh, we're discussing today address the compliance with city ordinances. Uh, this is the, the beginning. It's not the end. Uh, the public process will be, uh, will continue to be uh, rigorous. Uh, it will go through the Board of Finance at, and it will go through the City Council process and you're very familiar with uh, that process. So with respect to uh, the community, your specific community concerns and the concerns of SB6, uh, there is a rigorous and open uh, process uh, that will allow specific community concerns to be raised and uh, agreements to be made on all of those things that you're made that that uh, the issues that you raised. This is these MOUs um, moving forward today. Sp uh, simply speak to the compliance with the uh, ordinances that must be uh, addressed before it can go through. You know, start through the more public process. But I think the issue that he's speaking to is unlike this process when we went through Harbor Point. It didn't come to the Board of Estimates until after we had did our second um, reader in the City Council. So this process, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I don't like the way this has gone because it did not go through the Council process like we did with Harbor Point. And I don't know why we're here today because I had no knowledge of this either. We was just informed last week, the controller and I, and I'm asking for a deferral as well because this should go before the city council and we should vet this before it even come before this body. So I'm in total agreement with you that this is not the venue to have this come before the Board of Vestment. I was not a part of this negotiation, nor was the controller, and I want a deferral on this too until it comes before the city council of Baltimore. This is not the process. Also, can, also, may I speak? Also, I, I have, um, I was briefed last week, and some of the changes that I requested have been made. But my major concern is that there is a goal to have 10%, and I believe it should be a requirement because if we're saying for this new Port Covington project that we really want to be inclusionary, then it shouldn't be a goal because, Commissioner Graziano, I, I heard you say that if there were not 10%, that there would be a formula of $3,000 that escalates to 5,000 mm -hmm. and that it would have affordable housing elsewhere in the city. But if we wanna be inclusion, it should be on the site. And I, I have a problem with the word goal. I think it should be a requirement. If we really want to include affordable housing, it should be on the project site. And we agree. And, and that is the way it's structured that but they have an the, option out. Well, the, only if. But they uh, have an the, option out. The, the, they actually don't have an option. They have to. Developers shall use commercially reasonable efforts to apply for low income housing tax credits. If they don't apply for the. They must apply for the tax credits. But if, if, they, if they don't apply for the tax credits, 
they are in breach of the agreement. Um, and, and, and the remedy is not to pay the $3,000. The, 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 the first requirement is that they must apply for the tax credits. And uh, with my experience in the tax credit program, uh, I would say that any project in this, pro in this, any tax credit application in this project area would do very well. Uh, we got six, we got seven, I'm sorry, tax credit projects approved in this city in the last round, 494 units. And none of the locations that we're talking about in those seven sites is, is in any way comparable to uh, what we'll have here in this new community. So um, I am confident that um, the developer will submit because that's what they're required to do. I am confident that the city will support those proposals as we have uh, all good tax credit proposals. And I am confident that the state of Maryland will approve those tax credit uh, projects. I have a question for you, Mr. Nielsen. Do we have to go through this process um, different than what we went through with Harbor Point? Well, Do we need to go through this process? Well, let, let me just comment on both the mayor's point and your point. It seems to me that, as the mayor said, this is but the beginning of the process of working out the particulars of the arrangements between the city and the developers of the Port Covington project. Um, there will be a second stop along the way at the Board of Finance, which I think is scheduled for next week, and that will be an open consideration by the Board of Finance. And there will be what I'm sure will be a rigorous, open, deliberative process before the Council and, and Council President Young. If, that, if those deliberations before the Council and the action of the Council change the terms but why not bring it back or differ from the so term, why not bring it back or Mr. then Nielsen? it will come back but Clearly. why not bring it back like we did with harbor point if, if why if does the, it have to come now right. if the council acts differently if the council imposes different or other uh, uh conditions then that they will govern and these mous Mr. will come Nielsen, back my to the, question to the is board. but my question is why have it now. Why can't it come after the council process like we did with Harbor Point? Uh, you, you probably have to talk to the people who decided to make it to do it in this fashion. But that my question back to you is why well, not? Who were they? My question is why not? Who do were this they? Now? Well, uh, who were they? Well, you t talk to talk to people who are who've been. Dealing. I don't know who they were. Well, th they're standing before you. There are three people who are here to address well, can the MOUs answer that, that are in front of you. Can y'all answer that for me? I think that the, the mayor um, uh, laid it out. Um, our job in the housing department is to determine uh, it, that any project receiving a subsidy is uh, in compliance with the inclusionary housing ordinance. But what ordinance. makes it different than the Harbor Point project when you all waited until after we did the second reader? Well, I think uh, from the housing perspective, um, this project offers a much greater opportunity for on-site housing than the Harbor Point project did. Given the nature of the project, given the size of the site, given the location, given the, the range of housing types, uh, frankly, Harbor Point was not an ideal place to build the inclusionary housing units. There were a lot of high-rise buildings with very, very small oh, units. Oh, that's, that's not my question. Well, I'm saying that's the difference here is Regardless that- Regardless of whether it's a difference or not. Yeah. That's not what I asked. I asked why didn't this project wait until after the council did its due diligence I and then come back with it. Opportunity. And Christine Bivens, Mayor's Office of Minority Women-Owned Business Development. Good morning, Council President, Madam Comptroller, Madam Mayor, and Honorable Board Members. Um, to answer your question, the, particularly on the supplier diversity and inclusion piece of it, one of the things that we find, Harbor Point was great. It was a good model to start with, um, but it, it came again, later in the process. The earlier we start in the process with ensuring inclusion of minority and women-owned businesses, particularly when we get to pre-development and inclusion in minority equity ownership, the better for us. So even though the TIF has not been approved, and the TIF is going through the process, that process will still continue. But we want to have a seat at the table with the developers. We want our advocates to have seats at the table with the developers to be able to help shape the inclusion on what goes forward through, you know, as it goes through the process. I mean, that was for us. Well, I'm a big supporter of this project. I think it's going to be a wonderful project. And, and, and all I'm saying is it should have went through the same process, the same process. You know, you can have you, you, you can go ahead, Madam Mayor. But all I'm saying is it should have went through that process. 
So it's, it's my understanding, and I see the president of BDC here, um, it's my understanding that uh, different uh, from the Harbor Point um, development that the BDC board made the approval of the MO, the MOU as a condition. If you could, if, can you speak to, yes can the president could. speak to that? The question, uh, Mr. President, is uh, the difference in the process between uh, this uh, development project and MOU. Sure. Mr. President, uh, Bill Cole, President and CEO of uh, Baltimore Development Corporation. The slight difference in this situation is that the BDC board made a condition of its approval, the approval of these MOUs before it can move forward. So the BOE must act on the MOUs before this process can move forward to the Board of Finance. It was one of the five conditions that the BDC board um, added in its recommendation to the mayor. Uh, why, I mean, why would they do that? Well, because, I, I mean, these MOUs are fundamentally, um, they're critical to the overall TIF. We need to make certain that they comply with these ordinances. But wouldn't it literally tie the hands of the council? No. Not at all. No. Absolutely not. Not at all. Mr. President, the, the council still has its full ability yeah. and capacity to negotiate um, during the council and, process. And I would second but that. Isn't, as I said, but as isn't I the BDC board an advisory board? Correct. They don't, yes. I mean, so they're just advisory. So we don't have to take what they say. No, it, it, it is a recommendation. Okay, well, they just, a rec they just made a recommendation. So we don't have to go by that. Correct. And you don't have to abide strictly by the terms of the MOUs that are approved here. If you and the council, in your deliberations, as I said a few minutes ago, reach different conclusions and impose more stringent um, requirements on the developer than are embodied in these MOUs, then these MOUs will, get, will be back here to be conformed to the fi council's well, well, final action. Well, well we could have made this a whole lot easier if you're asking me as a member of the Board of Estimate to vote on something. You're asking the controller as a member of the Board of Estimate to vote on something that we had absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Well, you can continue. The next person can come up. Um, restate my name. Christine Bivens, Mayor's Office, Minority Women-Owned Business Development. And so actually, I was going to start with beginning with the Harbor Point project. The city started this new model of bringing awareness of inclusion of minority women-owned businesses earlier in the stages of these public-private partnerships um, and relationships. Port Covington project that's currently on the review stages, the developer has committed to comply already with the MWBE law that's administered by the Minority and Women's Business Opportunity Office, and that's going to ensure MBE and WBE goals are applied to each phase of the construction on the project. Um, this MOU, like the Harbor Point MOU, sets up this framework that can be built upon and it will ensure maximum inclusion beyond and even before the construction phase of the project. Um, for instance, in this MOU, the developers agreed to provide access to business opportunities in pre-development phase. That's going to include professional services like surveying, engineering, environmental monitoring, title and escrow services, and the list goes on. Uh, the highlights of the MOU include that the developer and its general contractors will participate in the city's me mentor-protege program, as Harbor Point developers are already doing, and its general contractors, supporting joint venture, MBE ownership and equity opportunities. It's going to support capacity building programs, providing access to technical training, capital, and mentors. It will also hire an independent third-party consultant to monitor, measure, and evaluate its MWBE achievement in all aspects and during the life of the project. And it will ensure MBE, WB inclusion in its maker and innovation spaces and as it attracts high tech manufacturing and technology companies. So we want to have um, a wraparound effect of minority and women business inclusion. Um, by establishing this framework earlier in the process, we believe it's going to provide a stronger voice for our small minority and women owned businesses to help and assist the developer in ensuring that or in its inclusion efforts and ensuring that it is being uh, gain, gaining maximum inclusion in this project. <laughs> Um, this MOU also creates an advisory board that's going to meet quarterly, and that advisory board is made up of those advocates that will meet quarterly at the, we will convene at MWBD with the developer and those advisor. Will we have advocates. any input on, on, on those Absolutely. selections? Absolutely. Comptroller. Uh, Mr. Nielsen said that the, the council has the opportunity to make changes. So it just seems logical that the council should vet it and then bring it back because we're one city and we like working together. I, I was briefed last week and there were two changes that were made at my recommendation. 
However, I did not have sufficient time to really vet the MOUs to see if there were any other changes that I wanted to make. I'm pretty sure that if there are any other changes as a part of the council process, the council president would be amenable to including those. And I think what you're seeing is exactly the, the experience that you had with recommending the changes and seeing them included is us working together. And that process will continue. This is the beginning. It is not the end. It is a collaborative process and it is an ongoing process. And it is a clearly already a responsive process. But after this MOU is signed, it's gone. No. That's not true. That's yeah, not correct. Is. That's yeah, not correct, is. Council once President. This, once this no. MOU leave this board of estimate, it's done. No, if That's the council, if the council's uh, action on the, the on council, this the council can do its action, but this MOU would be binding. Not, yeah, not it if is. the council changes it as an yeah, in its it action is. on the project. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's it clearly is. not an understanding of the yeah. the, um, the the actual legal process. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Are you finished? Next, the next one. Next one. Madam, please go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Perkins. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Jason Perkins Cohen. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. I'm here today to talk to you about the MOU that respect that is uh, about the local hiring process. I'm going to highlight the seven uh, significant pieces of the MOU. First and foremost, uh, um, Madam, would you please? I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Yes, I can leave. Thank All you. right, let's go. I filed a protest. Let's I go. Want to be up here. You cannot speak, ma'am. Yeah, well. You're going to have to leave, Miss. Um, madam, you're going to have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave, ma'am. Or you stop talking. Leave. First and foremost, take uh, a seat, please. Just let her have a seat. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, first and foremost, the MOU makes clear that local hiring requirements will be followed as part of this MOU. Uh, as you all know, that means that 51% of all new hires must be Baltimore City residents, at least 51%. Uh, second of all, it establishes a goal that 20% of all those on the work site will be uh, Baltimore City residents as well. Uh, these uh, pieces of the MOU also don't just, uh, don't just relate to the developer, but they're carried down and they're required by the developer to carry them down to the contractors, the general contractors, and the subcontractors as well. The MOU also specifies that there'll be a workforce plan uh, that will be submitted in advance of the work starting. And that plan specifies the total number of uh, individuals that will be needed on the project and the total number of work hours that will be needed, uh, again, in advance. This is important, particularly on construction projects where often uh, some of those jobs are, are not long term. We want to make sure that Baltimore City residents are not just getting 51% of the total number of jobs, but at least 51% of the hours. Uh, and again, that's just a minimum threshold. In addition to the plan, of course, we don't just want to know what the plan is. We want to know what actually happens. So there's a manpower report that's required to be submitted monthly uh, by the developer that will follow the plan. So whatever they said that they're going to do up front in terms of the number of jobs and the number of work hours, they will be submitting monthly to us uh, to let us know how they're uh, doing in terms of achieving that goal. And released to the public every month. Continue. Uh, and then uh, one... Ms. Truhart, I'm going to have to ask you, I'm going to ask you to um, either be quiet or we're going to have to ask you to leave the hearing room. Ask the um, you're going to have to leave the hearing room. Okay. I'm going to ask you to leave the hearing room. One of the things you need to leave, the hear about. leave the hearing room. Leave the hearing room. Make sure that they so, go ahead, go ahead. Every of course, the agreement is incredibly important. But this is to leave the hearing room, Miss. Miss. This is also about. Adam, you have to leave. This is also about jobs. Mm -hmm. So the us. agree agreement Represent specifies us. that there will be a local hiring coordinator. So residents in the community that want to make sure they get access to these jobs have a single person of contact. It will work both for the developer, the general contractors, the subcontractors, and the community. That person will be responsible, and that is being paid for by the developer. Uh, as noted earlier, there will also be a contribution to youth work. So uh, at least 100 youth work uh, slots will be paid for by the developer on an annual basis. And finally, that there will be, uh, that the developer is committed for the first five years, uh, that there will be reliable, uh, affordable transportation 
uh, to the work site so that uh, residents can get to those uh, jobs. And if it's not uh, available, that they will subsidize the transportation costs. I, I would also like to, um, and I guess we can talk about this later, that the city have the ability to hire an auditor at the developer's expense to review and confirm that the terms of the MOU are met. Mr. Middleton. Yeah, I just wanted to conclude with members of the board that um, apparently this project has been put on a fast track. Um, I just heard that this matter goes before the Board of Finance next week. Um, with such speed in this process, it is difficult for community organizations such as ours, Fork and Cherry Hill, and the surrounding areas, because we don't have the resources to do the vetting of this type of project that others with resources may have. Um, this is a very important project. Uh, we don't have access to the papers that Baltimore Development Corporation has in the submission that was made. Um, by Sagamore. I mean, to us, in order to have legitimate types of negotiations, you got to have those types of documents. We don't have the resources to do that. Um, to look at the issues that are expressed in the bills presented before you today, to be prepared for the Board of Finance next week, is asking a lot of us in the community that hold that such a project is so vital to our very survival, to our future. And I'm only asking for a deferral. Not a vote against, just a deferral. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would entertain a motion. Oh, Councilwoman uh, Clark, did you want to say anything? Only what you need to come up. I've seen you back there doing all this. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I, 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 because I wanted this. Could you identify Terry yourself? Pat Clark, Baltimore City Council. Um, I just wanted to he hear the solicitor say what he did say, which is that this is a baseline that whatever the council does, um, we have the authority in the council to um, enlarge upon it, expand upon it. It's a baseline, and it would, if changed at the council level, would return to this board for um, right. putting it into con conformance with what was done at that point. And I, and I did say that, and I said it because the council is the final determinant with regard to the TIF. Uh, request or right. proposal, which is essential to the project. And that so this it's is the baseline. Will be the, the final so, action. Ms. Mr. President, Madam Mayor, Madam Controller, etc., thank you very much for that's what I was the most concerned about as a member of the City Council. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I will entertain a motion. And having been reminded by the Councilwoman of that point, I'd also <laughs> like to observe in making the motion that the, um, th the protest was filed late, but we all agreed on the board that given the fact given the size of the project and the and the importance of the issue and given the fact that the protesting party is not um, a bidder who make, make protests all the time of actions taken by the board where we hold and will continue to hold the bidders to strict compliance with timeliness requirements we waived the timeliness so that we could hear from you and the others this morning and with that background i'd move to approve the three mous submitted to the board second all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Please note that um, I vote no, and I want to read my statement. I believe that the parties involved in working in good faith to craft the three agreements before this board. I also understand that the administration views the agreement as a baseline set of goals to be expanded upon down the road, but the administration is asking me as a representative for the citizens of Baltimore to sign off on legally binding documents that contain inadequate benefits for the citizens most impacted by the project. Let me be clear, I believe that Port Covington project could be a game changer for the entire city of Baltimore. This development represents a once in a generational deal that could potentially improve employment and housing options for the working poor and middle class families two groups that represent many of Baltimore's most vulnerable and overlooked citizens. That's why I'm so disappointed with the agreements no negotiated by the administration. I know that we can ink a better deal. I know that Sagamore is committed to the city of Baltimore and its citizens. I know the developer wants to put his stamp on a historic community agreement that matches the boldness of his request for public financing dollars. The three agreements negotiated by the administration lack boldness and vision and bonus and visions are required for a project of this size. 
It is for the reason I've outlined that I cannot vote in favor of the MOU. I will monitor the movement of the developer's request. Should the MOUs come to the City Council, I'm confident that the developer stands ready and willing to negotiate for the benefit of the community. In order for this project to be successful in, coming, in the coming stages, the community must have a say. So I hope the developers will immediately reach out to the community for their input. While I support this development project, I think there's more work to do. I think the city can get more and will get more during the council process. And I personally look forward to working with the developer over the coming months. Please note that I vote no. The motion carries. I also, I also, I also vote no. While I think that the new Fort Covington project can have enormous benefits to the city, and I am in total support of the project, I am concerned that we have not had enough time to review the details of the proposed MOUs. For example, the inclusionary housing MOU should have, a, should have affordable housing goal changed to a requirement. Furthermore, it should be clearly stated that the affordable housing unit should be on the new Port Covington site as opposed to another area of the city. And also, I am proposing that the city have the ability to hire an auditor at the developer's expense to review and confirm that the terms of the MOU have been met. For these reasons, I am voting no for the MOUs. The motion carries. There have been no more business before the board. The meeting will recess until 12 noon. Thank you. Good afternoon. The board is now in session for the receiving and opening of bids. I have the following addendum to note. Department of Public Works Water Contract 1278 Old York Road and vicinity water main replacements. Please change the bid due date from April the 20th, 2016 to April the 27th, 2016. Hearing no objections, so ordered. The first item from the Department of Transportation, TR-01041R, replacement of Edmondson Avenue Bridge. Chiambro Corporation with a bid bond. Forty six million four hundred eighty six thousand nine hundred sixty nine dollars and sixty five cents. Forty six million four hundred eighty six thousand. Nine hundred sixty nine dollars and sixty five cents. The next one is Tudor Perenni Corporation. With a bid bond, the dollar amount is forty million three hundred thirty eight thousand. That's forty million three hundred thirty eight thousand. 
refer these bids to the Department of Transportation for tabulation and report. The next item is from the Bureau of Purchases, B5000-4496. Audit financial statements. The, this will be the technical opening. Prices will be not, prices will not be read. The first company is SB and Company LLC. The next company is Clifton Larson Allen. Refer these bids to the Bureau of Purchases for tabulation and report. The third item is the Bureau of Purchases B5000-4500, Pest Control Services. First bidder is Home Paramount Pest Control Companies, Inc. Total dollar amount is $135,350. That's $135,350. The next company is Solomon's Termite and Pest Control. The dollar amount is $23,450. That's The next company is A, B, and B, Termite and Pest Control. The total dollar amount is $90,750. That's One more? It should be one more. Regional pest management. The last one is Regional Pest Management. The dollar amount is $205,500. That's $205,500. Refer these bids to the Bureau of Purchases for tabulation and report. Next item is from the Bureau of Purchases B5000-4509, Supply and Deliver Spring and Fall 2016 Trees Planting and Maintenance. Lorentz Inc. Total bid price is $275,000. $785. That's $275,785. Refer this bid to the Bureau of Purchases for tabulation and report.
The last item is from the Bureau of Purchases, B5000-4514, Single Stream Recycling. The total dollar amount is $904,560. The name of the company, it's being submitted by Waste Management Recycle America, LLC. The name of the company is Waste Management Recycle America, LLC. And the total dollar amount is $904,560. That's $904,560. Refer this bid to the Bureau of Purchases for tabulation and report. There being no more business before this board, it is now in recess. It's adjourned.